After watching the horror movie Saw in early 2012, a German teenager named Fabian Kramer decided to stab his elderly landlady to death while wearing a mask inspired by the movie. For reasons only he knows to this day, the deranged youth went into 82-year-old Hannah Litz's apartment next door and plunged a knife into her 50 times. Then he called 911 and reported that someone was bleeding to death at the scene. When police arrived, Kramer was positioned next to his victim, pretending that he was trying to save her. It didn't take a genius to figure out that the young man, who was soaked in his dead landlady's blood, was lying. Within hours, officers had located the murder weapon and the disturbing mask inside Kramer's apartment. The suspect asserted his innocence, but the court didn't buy it. Kramer received a 10-year jail sentence for butchering Litz in what prosecutors call pure murderous lust. If it's determined he's still unstable at the end of his time, he'll remain locked up. Number 8. The Murder of Dorothy Jane Scott During a company meeting in May of 1980, 32-year-old secretary Dorothy Jane Scott drove an ailing co-worker, Conrad Bostrun, to the hospital after he began complaining of severe stomach pain. The pair were joined by another employee named Pam Head. Bostrom was discharged around 11 p.m. that night after receiving treatment for a black widow spider bite. He and Pam remained in the hospital while Dorothy went outside to get her car and pull it to the front of the building. Pam watched through the window as Dorothy's car sped away, and she was never seen or heard from alive again. Police learned that in the weeks leading up to Dorothy's disappearance, she had received numerous harassing phone calls at work. She told a co-worker that the caller watched her every move and knew an alarming amount of details about her life. Just a month after Dorothy's disappearance, the caller phoned the Orange County Register and took credit for her alleged murder, claiming he killed Dorothy because she had cheated on him. Even more disturbingly, the individual phoned Dorothy's home once a week every Wednesday for the next four years, taunting her mother with the same voice he had spoken to Dorothy with. He called when he knew Dorothy's mother was home alone and usually threatened to kill her or hold her captive, but he stopped calling after Dorothy's father answered the phone one day. Dorothy's skeletal remains were discovered in 1984 in Anaheim Hills, California, and her burned car was discovered in an alley in Santa Ana. The calls to her parents resumed and the police were never able to trace them, but they believe that the caller is responsible for Dorothy's murder. Number 7. Anonymous Arsonist when their car broke down along a Stockton, California road in 1989, a father and his son noticed a jacket laying on the roadside. Inside it, there was a VHS tape, which the curious pair took home and watched. To their horror, the tape contained homemade footage of a burning house, narrated by a panting man who spoke in a low whisper, saying, This is hell. Look at the flames. Listen to the coyotes yell. He said, Ancient spirit of evil, look at it. The fire department is trying to put it out. What a laugh. The disturbed viewers turned the video over to police, who found a ceramic skull and a mortar and pestle near where the jacket was discovered, and surmised that the Orson was likely the work of Satan worshippers. Unsolved Mysteries featured the bizarre film, and viewers called in identifying the crime scene location as Redwood City, where the house had burned down the previous year. The tips led the police to the culprits, two troubled teenage boys who were a lot less creepy in real life than they seemed in their sickening self-made video. Because they were underage, the suspect's identities were never revealed. Police linked the duo to at least 11 other fires in the area. One of the boys was sent to a psychiatric facility, while the other was placed in juvenile detention. As far as anyone knows, they served their time and were never linked to any later crimes. What do you think the reasoning behind this VHS tape was? Let me know in the comments below, especially if you don't know what a VHS tape is. And if you're liking this video, be sure to hit that thumbs up button and subscribe if you haven't already. Number 6. The Abduction of Angela Hammond 20-year-old Clinton, Missouri resident Angela Hammond had a lot going for her. She was a well-liked college student that worked at a bank and had recently gotten engaged to her boyfriend, Rob Schaefer. One day in January 1991, Angela dropped Rob off at home with the plans to reconvene later that evening. After hanging out with a friend for a little while, Angela called her fiancé from a payphone at an intersection seven blocks from her home. During their conversation, she observed a suspicious man in a green Ford pickup truck circle the block several times before pulling up beside the payphone and exiting his vehicle. He used the phone next to the one Angela was using, got back into his truck, and then pulled out a flashlight and began searching for something. Angela asked the man if he needed to use the phone, and he said he would try calling someone momentarily. Seconds later, Rob heard Angela scream and the man say, I didn't need to use the phone anyway. Rob immediately dropped his phone and got into his car to drive to the payphone Angela was at. Along the way, 
the green truck drove past him from the opposite direction. Rob heard Angela scream out to him as the vehicles passed one another, prompting him to throw his car into reverse and follow it. But his transmission blew two miles into the chase, and the truck was soon out of sight. The Missouri State Highway Patrol conducted an exhaustive search, inspecting hundreds of vehicles matching the description Rob provided, but they had no luck finding any signs of Angela or her abductor. Meanwhile, police questioned Rob's story. And thankfully, two individuals who had seen the truck came forward and he was quickly cleared of suspicion. Investigators connected the case to two other crimes within a 100-mile radius, including the assault and murder of a convenience store clerk, Trudy Darby, and the disappearance of another clerk named Cheryl Kenny. Although someone was convicted in Trudy Darby's killing, Angela and Cheryl's cases remain cold, with no solid evidence linking any suspects to their abductions and no bodies to prove that they were murdered, it's unlikely that the cases will ever be solved unless new evidence comes to light. Number 5. Vanished at Sea In 2010, British-born Rebecca Coriam became a crew member of the cruise ship Disney Wonder, which was based in the port of Los Angeles. She kept in regular contact with her family until March 21st of 2011, when she sent her loved ones the last message they would ever receive from her. Rebecca didn't show up to work the next morning. She was nowhere to be found and didn't respond to multiple pages requesting her presence. Surveillance footage from earlier that day showed Rebecca in an obvious state of distress while talking on the phone in a designated crew area. A man walked by and asked her if she was okay, to which she said, yeah, fine, before hanging up the phone and walking away. And then she was never seen or heard from again. A search through international waters found no evidence of Rebecca going overboard. Yet the ship's captain offered his condolences, saying he believed a huge wave had washed Rebecca into the sea. Writing for The Guardian, journalist Ron Johnson rode this same Disney Wonder route Rebecca disappeared on. Numerous crew members anonymously told him that the authorities and the cruise company knew more than they were letting on. According to one employee, everyone knew that Rebecca had indeed gone overboard from a crew deck during inclement weather and that it was captured on surveillance footage. Her family was denied access to the alleged video and the final report on their daughter's death. What's more, her relatives and co-workers did not recognize a pair of flip-flops found on the deck that the cruise company had said belonged to Rebecca. Her disappearance remains shrouded in secrecy to this day, and sadly, this is one of dozens of unsolved cruise ship disappearances in recent decades that authorities and cruise lines alike don't seem to want to talk about. Number 4. The Murder of Blair Adams 31-year-old Canadian resident Blair Adams began acting strangely in 1996, suffering from severe mood swings and insomnia, claiming that someone was out to kill him, but refusing to give further detail. Then he withdrew his entire bank account and attempted to cross the border into the U.S. Immigration turned him away due to the large sum of money and valuables on him, which they believed fit the profile of someone involved in drug trafficking. The next day, Adams quit his construction job and bought a plane ticket to Frankfurt, Germany. Hours later, however, he showed up at a friend's house and begged her to help him cross the border because someone was trying to murder him. She declined to help and Adams cancelled his ticket and crossed the border in a rental car. He abandoned the vehicle at the airport, bought a one-way ticket to Washington, D.C., at twice the price of a round-trip ticket, mind you, and rented another car when he got there and drove to Knoxville despite not knowing anyone in the area. Adams got a hotel room and was never seen again alive after leaving. His body was found in a parking lot a half mile away, with $4,000 Canadian, American, and German currency strewn around him. The man's pants were pulled down and inside out, leaving him naked from the waist down. His socks were removed, and his shirt was ripped open. Next to Adam's body was a fanny pack with valuables, including jewelry, gold, and platinum. He died from a blow to the stomach, perhaps from a club or a crowbar, and his forehead was sliced open. Adams fought for his life as evidenced by defensive wounds on his hands. Authorities contend that his fear of being in danger was imaginary, but that he had actually been murdered nonetheless. His family remains without answers, still hoping today that someone will come forward and provide information about what led to Adam's death. So what do you think Adam was involved with? Number 3. Reality TV Guest Goes Missing in November of 2011, 33-year-old Florida resident Michelle Parker went missing the very same day a pre-taped episode of The People's Court that she appeared on aired. In the show, Parker and her ex-fiancé Dale Smith fought over an engagement ring, which had allegedly gotten lost after Parker threw it at her estranged lover during an argument. Judge Marilyn Milan ruled in Smith's favor to the tune of $2,500. 
The same day the episode aired, Parker dropped her and Smith's twins off at his house. She never showed up for her bartending shift that night, and her Hummer was found abandoned on the west side of Orlando the next day. Smith, who was suspected but never charged, eventually moved to Tennessee with their children. Before Parker disappeared, she and Smith endured a contentious child custody battle, which included allegations by Parker that Smith acted violently in front of their kids. He remains the prime suspect to this day. Police are still at a loss to explain what happened to Parker and have pled with the public numerous times for help solving her disappearance. They believe that someone out there knows the truth and are holding out hope that someone comes forward. Number 2. A Family Affair Marcus Wesson grew up in Kansas as a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. His mother was reportedly a religious fanatic, and his father an abusive alcoholic who abandoned his family before they moved to San Bernardino, California during his childhood. After leaving the army, Wesson shacked up with a woman named Rosemary Solario, with whom he had a child. He married Solario's daughter Elizabeth when she was just 15, and the couple ended up having 10 kids together. Wesson homeschooled his many children, teaching them out of a handwritten Bible that claimed Jesus Christ was a vampire, and made his wife and kids call him master. All the while, he never held steady work, instead relying on welfare to make ends meet. The girls were forbidden from interacting with the boys or their mother, and were told that their destiny was to become Wesson's wives. He abused and impregnated five female relatives, including two daughters and three nieces. In the meantime, Wesson instructed his family to prepare for Armageddon. In 2004, several family members rebelled against Wesson and descended on his compound, demanding the release of their children. A standoff ensued between Wesson and the Fresno police, after which officers discovered nine dead bodies in a tangled pile on a bedroom floor near a collection of antique coffins. The victims included two of Wesson's daughters and seven of their children, who had all been shot in the eye. Wesson was convicted of nine counts of murder the following year, and is currently on death row in San Quentin Prison. Number 1. A Stolen Identity Taken to the Grave on Christmas Eve 2010, a Texas woman known as Lorianne Ruff tragically committed suicide, leaving behind her husband and child. Her surviving in-laws tried to learn more about the woman, only to encounter one obstacle after another in figuring out who she really was. A lockbox in Ruff's closet contained documents revealing her true identity, including a birth certificate belonging to someone named Becky Sue Turner, who died in a house fire at two years old and name change paperwork permitting someone to become Lori Erica Kennedy. The Ruff family sought the help of a Social Security Administration investigator, who was just as stumped as they were when he tried to get to the bottom of things. Finally, after years of searching, a DNA match to the deceased woman's third cousin revealed Ruff's true identity as someone named Kimberly McLean, who had left home at 18 years old and never returned. Her family had searched for her tirelessly but never found her, even though she didn't pick up her false identity until two years after she went missing. By all appearances, she lived a rather normal life from there on out. She had no known criminal record or ties to any cults or any other shady organizations, but simply wanted nothing to do with her family for reasons she took to the grave.